Well, good morning, poetry lovers. Today's Sunday. It's the perfect day for us to do a close reading of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, God's Grandeur. Uh, I forgot to tell you yesterday that the annotations on spring and fall were brought to you by the Musgrave Pencil Company's Tennessee Red, uh, made of genuine Tennessee red cedar. Whereas today, your close reading is brought to you by a company from across the pond in Switzerland, Caron Dash. It's an HB pencil, and it's the Graphique. Ooh, delightful. All right, so a little bit about this uh, particular poem. It's a sonnet, and specifically it's a Petrarchan sonnet, rhyming A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A, C-D, C-D, C-D. Um, now, Hopkins believed that the only other really acceptable scheme uh, for the rhyme for, a, uh, for an Italian sonnet was C-D-E, C-D-E. Um, Hopkins, as it turns out, was, was relatively dismissive of the English sonnet for largely technical reasons. Uh, he believed that it failed in perfection because in the, that transition of the form from Italian to English, um, we all know who brought the Italian form to England, don't we? The number of syllables didn't correspond. Uh, recall that the iambic pentameter line that's so characteristic of the English form features 10 total syllables, but the Italian sonnet was built around a hendecasyllabic, generally, or 11 syllable line, although in some cases, of course, the Italian uh, line traveled on to you know, 12, 13, 14 syllables, okay? Uh, further, the English line begins um, on an off beat, or what Hopkins referred to as a slack syllable, while the Italian line began with a stress syllable. Uh, in Italian, then, he argued that there, there was a natural ellipsis brought about by running together or slurring three or four initial vowels, and the syllables themselves were longer in Italian than in English. Uh, you'll recall that early on our conversation about, um, we're talking about verse forms, and uh, in the presentation on the pure syllabic verse system, um, I noted that syllables have a temporal quality, that they have, um, individual syllables have duration. Notice the difference in the single syllable for the word did, D-I-D, uh, that's short and it terminates with that clamp down D sound, while squelch is long on the tongue. Okay, so this, this ellipsis, uh, and by that I mean uh, not the rhetorical um, device that we have talked about that is um, um, characteristic of, a, of a, a sentence that is devoid either of the, uh, the noun in the main clause or the verb in the main clause. Here we're talking about a pause. And so, in, in um, Hopkins' mind, this pause acts as would a counter move in jumping up. So if I ask you to jump as high as you can, uh, perhaps to touch the rim on a basketball goal, or you know, in my case, maybe uh, scrape the bottom of the net, um, you would probably bend down, gather yourself uh, in a crouching uh, position, and then spring upward. So this idea is the basis for the sprung rhythm verse system that you read about in the biography on Hopkins and about which we will talk in class tomorrow. So um, the architecture of this, this particular sonnet is the tetrameter foot, but it's, it's the sprung rhythm foot. Uh, it's not the essential syllabic foot that we <coughs> are so familiar with. Um, instead, given Hopkins' system, there, you'll see that there are four stress syllables per line. And so I want you to, to listen for them as I read, and then we will mark them together. Uh, God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, 
and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at scanning this, uh, this poem using, uh, and this is just a, a um, I just want you to mark it as I'm marking it uh, in the presentation that I'm going to give you on Sprung Rhythm that, that I think will help you to better understand um, what it is that uh, Hopkins is trying to do with his system. I just want you to mark it as I'm marking it. Okay, So um, I've marked over here on the left the number of syllables per line and you've got basically 10 beats per line except you've got 12 in the third line. Okay, Now He's using this, I think, to, to create some slackness before he builds us into his fundamental question, which is, why don't men listen to what he says, what God says, or follow his rules? Okay, so if we're marking it, then we're going to do this. All right, I'm going, world is charged with the grandeur of God. Okay, so you'll see that this, is, this operates almost like an iambic foot here, an iambic foot here, and then, what is that? An anapestic foot. And then, um, sorry, two anapests that, that finish it off. So, grandeur of God. Okay? It will, anapestic foot is what starts, you see how it gathers itself? Flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness. And note, note there's an outride here. Okay, So you, I want you to mark this with a little uh, trophy looking line like that. See it? Okay, That's an outride. What it does is that when in one of his feet, when there is a, um, when there's more than uh, two syllables that follow, the stress syllable, then he marks it with this uh, with this outride. You remember I said a, a moment ago in the introduction to this poem, um, the the sort of compression, the slurring of syllables, the gathering as we get to the point. Okay, the stress syllable here. Okay, so greatness, and then we have an outride here, like the ooze of oil. And then the word here, you'd think that the word crushed, and I may have uh, given it too much uh, emphasis when I read it, but the word crushed here doesn't receive the uh, doesn't receive a beat, even though it's the the point of the ooze of oil being crushed. Because as you know from your note, we're talking about uh, the crushing of olives to make olive oil. Okay, um, and so uh, we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. Why do men, so we've got that outride, crushed, follows over to why do men then now not wreck or listen to his rod or rules? These are the, these are the fundamentally important things that he's trying to, uh, he's accentuating here in this line. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all, okay, all, and then we have these words that, that, look at this internal rhyme, it's marvelous. Seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot. So bare gets the stress. We've got an outride here. Foot gets stressed, 
feel get stressed and shod get stressed okay and for all this nature is never spent there lives the dearest freshness and we have an outright here oh sorry we don't um, deep is is stressed but then these two are are, are an offbeat down things and though okay we got the outright here between and and though the last lights off the black west went oh morning stress on the first syllable in morning the brown brink eastward springs because the holy first syllable and holy ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with and then here's that we, we accentuate that word because this is the the moment of epiphany and he's um, uh, in celebration of the the Holy Ghost that we uh, most often see um, represented as as a dove yes Okay, so there's the scansion of it. Um, I, I, I suppose I don't really need to do this for you, um, you know, because I've already said that we're talking about the the A B B A, A B B A that is so typical of the Petrarchan or Italian sonnet. Uh, spent then is your. I'm gonna put it over here, even though it kind of bugs me. Uh, the the C line. Then things is your D line, went is your C, springs is your D, bent is your C, and then wings, of course, is your D line. Okay, so we're, we're now going to look at a, at a number of different things. Um, we're going to look at word choice. We're going to look at acoustics. Um, one thing that I'm going uh, to point out, and, and it's going to be, uh, I'll really emphasize this tomorrow when we talk about pied beauty. Um, pied means... Um, you know, sort of uh, like a multivariant color generally, okay? So uh, if you had a, a pied cow, it's one that might be, um, you know, have black splotches on white. Um, and so the, the, there's a simultaneity in, in what it is that he's saying here. So uh, like pied beauty, what Hopkins seeks to do here is he's highlighting um, both things that are dual perhaps two things at once and the duality in all things okay so let's take a look then at, at some examples of it um, and I'll, I'll mark uh, some of the um, some of the acoustics here of course we have grandeur and God so you know this is a uh, you know the alliteration that we have probably ask you a question about that of course um, so the world is charged. Let's take a look at that word charged, right? If the world is charged with the grandeur of God, well, charge can mean two things then. Um, one, it's electrified by, all right, electrified by, but it is also then commanded. Charge, so if I, you know, uh, if I charge you with some task, okay, um, here, you know, this is like God's commandments, the thing that God's telling you to do. And so the world then is charged by God so in, in both senses, commanded by um, and electrified by God, okay? It will flame out. Okay, so just, it's a, it's a marvelous, um, think, of the, think of this visual image here, okay? So when we talk about flaming out, in one hand, it sounds as though we're talking about uh, about it being extinguished, and maybe this is you know um, the, the the concept of the word ending in uh, the world ending in fire or something, but but it's also by flaming out means that it uh, it radiates. Okay, it's casting light, like and so we have this the nice simile here. Yes. Um, like shining from shook foil. So uh, we have the sibilance of the S's there and the SH shining from shook foil. And so remember, we, we talked about what a foil is, that um, it's, the, uh, it's the, the, the sort of pressed down and rolled out 
uh, like tin foil or gold foil or any of the kind of metals that are that are bright that allow uh, when light shines on them, we talked about the foil with respect to jewelry making and uh, jewelry display, that it allows light to go through the through the gemstone. So uh, you know diamonds in particular, since they have lots of facets cut into them, the light goes through the uh, through the diamond, and then it's reflected back off of the foil that's behind it. And so think about the 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 physical act of taking a uh, a sheet of uh, a foil that has the ability to reflect light and shaking it and what happens with the light I mean it's just going to be refracted all over the place okay so so the world is is then in in, in Hopkins uh, the use of that simile there it's um, the, the light is just uh, is not just radiating out in one direction but it's going in all sorts of directions because of the uh, the, the, the multivariate surfaces on the foil, okay. So if you're gonna um, if you're gonna unpack that um, that figurative device there, that simile, then what you're gonna do is we're gonna say that the tenor then of course is what this is the world, the charge. We'll call it the charged world, okay. And then the vehicle. So what, what's the thing being compared to? So this is light reflected off. The shook foil. All right, the light being reflected off the shook foil, and so then the ground, of course, is 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 something that is is able to reflect and cast light off in in, in a variety of directions simultaneously. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, looking at the, the 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 marvelous thing about the poem is that there's lots of, of visual imagery, of course. But there's also at what one of the things that uh, that Hopkins is is absolutely famous for doing, and it's uh, it's characteristic, emblematic of his poetry, is the use of the acoustic devices uh, within the line that provide then the the sort of auditory image that is going along with the visual image that he's creating through the individual words. So it gathers to a greatness, like the ooze of oil. Ooh, uh, oi. So the, those, those, uh, it's it's as though the, the those syllables are being compressed, okay, into the word crush that shows up next. So something that oozes goes slowly. Yes. All right. So then this is all with with this offbeat syllable here, crushed. And it's almost as though the speaker himself is crushed by the idea. Okay, the speaker is a Jesuit priest. He's, he's crushed by the idea of, of men not following God's word. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? So look at all those ends. So we have the then, now, not. All right, so that's consonants. All right, probably going to ask you a question about that. The consonants and those ends there. And then the R of wreck his rod. It's almost like he's growling at us, is it not? Okay, then here, generations have trod, have trod, have trod. You can hear the, the this is the, um, uh, it, it's sort of this, uh, the, the sound of footsteps, but it's plodding footsteps, okay? That, that they're not lively, they're not excited or active. It's, it's drudgery, they are trudging through the world. Okay, so let me point out a, a device that is similar to one that we have um, uh, we've been introduced to before. Uh, you learn that epizuxis is the repetition of a single word uh, two, typically three times in close succession. This is a similar device, and it's called epimony. I'm going to spell that for you. It's E-P-I-M-O-N-E. -E. Guaranteed question on that. So epimony then is the repetition of a generally a short phrase. Okay, short phrase. And so just like with epizuxis or any figure of repetition, it is uh, it is designed for uh, to create a sense of emphasis. But here, because it's repeating the same thing, that is uh, separated by the commas. That that repetition suggests a um, 
an almost mindless uh, repeating of something that that men are doing without thinking that they are they are reduced to this. Okay, and here we go. And all is seared with trade. Okay, this is work. Yes, bleared, smeared with toil. Okay, so trade being the business and then toil being the working. So the idea that you are uh, to be, so if you've ever been bleary-eyed, it's the, um, you can't see clearly. And if you are smeared with toil, notice how this, this comes back to the idea of the oil. Okay, when you're smeared with something, it's, it's sort of haphazardly, you're marked by it, you're marred by it. And so, so man is, is then, um, you know, his vision of things is bleared and... Um, I mean, and think about it, seared, meaning burned, okay, like you would do to a, to a steak, a uh, steak that's dropped on, on something hot, like a hot iron, okay, and then you're smeared with toil, and, okay, wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. I mean, he, he although he's a man himself, of course, uh, because we are men, we are flawed, and, and that, that implicit comparison between man and God is, is what he is all about here. Remember I talked to you about the idea of pie, the things that are, there's that duality. And so if God is supposed to be part of, of men, because we have not followed his rules, God is out of us, is what uh, Hopkins is arguing here. And where's man's smudge? So it's, it's the world, by the way. Okay, right? The, the, the world is the subject for all this mess that's happening. And it's seared with these things. And where's man's smudge? Because a smudge is something dirty. And shares man's smell, which, okay, I mean, that's, that's not complimentary. So we have the implied olfactory. Uh, nice question there. So the implied olfactory image. The soil is bare now. I mean, devoid of life, nor can foot feel, the alliteration of the F, foot feel being shod. So we, we've lost touch with nature. And, and this is, look, uh, Hopkins is, is, the, is the bridge between the, the Romantic period, um, well, really the Victorian period and, uh, and modernism. Okay? His poems didn't, weren't first published until 1918, and this is decades after his death. Um, early anthologies had him placed in the modern era because that first collection of poems uh, that were that were published by his friend Bridges uh, didn't make an appearance in, until you know the second decade of the 20th century. But he is a Victorian, and we have to treat him as one because he is so um, his work and his sensibilities are informed by the Victorian era, and and we'll talk about the Victorian era being somewhat repressive uh, overall. But but here. Um, he still retains that certain, uh, the, the, the romanticism. Uh, I mean, he wrote early poems in, you know, in the, in the, the mode of, of Keats and the other romantic poets. And so this is, um, uh, this is very much a romantic image uh, or, or, or emblematic of a romantic sensibility. Okay, so, um, and for all this, N, nature is never, so we got that uh, alliteration, is never spent Okay, so spent here uh, means two things. One is tired, and the other is used up. Okay, tired or used up. There lives, and, and, and notice in the, in the sestet here, there's this turning that the tone seems, uh, it's changed. I mean, so the, we know the volta has occurred here okay as it generally does in the ninth line for the Italian sonnet and for all this okay despite all this nature is never spent there lives the dearest freshness deep down things oh, there's nice D's okay the alliteration of the dearest freshness deep down things and then here with this outride and though the last lights off the black west went oh morning at the brown brink eastward springs so that's just marvelous sense of action that's happening here because and, and he's got like a baby turn here that that's um, that's a little bit reminiscent of, of what happens in the English sonnet why does all this happen 
because the Holy Ghost over the bent world, bent but not broken, okay? There's still the promise of God here, um, uh, the, 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 the Trinity. And so he's going to make that manifest here in this last line. Over the bent, not broken, bent world, broods. Look at, this, look at the combination of the sounds here. WBR, world, broods, warm, breast, and then the inversion here at the end. Look at that. With bright wings. World broods with warm breasts and with ah, bright wings. All right. So if you were going to um, to unpack this um, uh, this implied metaphor here, then what we've got is the tenor is the Holy Ghost. Yep. I'll move that out so we can see a little bit better. Um, the vehicle is what? It's a nesting hen. And hens in particular, I mean they're they're well known for their uh, their maternal nature. They you know they sit on the eggs and the and the eggs hatch and, and their little chicks um, are are protected by her and, and hens are fierce protectors of their young. And so the Holy Ghost is is sheltering the world, yes? It broods and, and brood okay has two meanings. Uh, brood is the name that is used for um, for the, the the sort of clutch of chicks that um, uh, that are that hens. But here the word brood has another meaning. As a verb, it means to um, to ponder something. Because I'm going to be asking you questions about what these you know the 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 multiplicity of meanings that these words have, or at least the duality of meanings that they have. Okay. All right. So then, um, if you're looking for the ground of this, um, then you're talking about a protective uh, maternal figure. And as you, as we have already talked about, the the Holy Spirit is often uh, portrayed as being um, as being a bird, but but normally a dove, you know, a sign of peace and so forth. But to compare it then to um, to the nesting hen, and then the bright wings, okay, as the uh, as the Holy Spirit opens up to the world, uh, and again that that image of the dove now sort of um, comes in and and rather takes the place of the brood hen. Then we're, we we end with this marvelous um, expression of deep emotion with the ah right wings. Okay, all right. So that's all I got for you today, and um, join me tomorrow for a couple more poems.